Welcome back to the channel and to today's presentation, we're going to be discussing oxygen therapy as well as the modes of oxygenation stemming from the lowest modality to the most invasive one. Now here are a few things to take into consideration as we move forward. The labs when discussing oxygenation are going to be PaO2 and SaO2. Now PaO2, this stands for the partial pressure of oxygen while SaO2 stands for the saturation of oxygen. What's the difference? Well, PaO2, this reflects inhaled oxygen, while SaO2 reflects oxygen that is already within circulation that is bound to our hemoglobin. So when we're looking at how much oxygen is bound to a red blood cell, we are pretty much looking at how saturated is a red blood cell. So if we have a decreased PaO2, this means that there is going to be a decreased amount of oxygen that is being inhaled and distributed to our blood and tissues, which is going to equal a decreased SaO2 level as well. Now, 60 is going to be the number that we're like, okay, it can't drop below this. But in the case where we're going into a decline in oxygenation, we do not want that O2 level dropping below 60 when it comes to the PaO2. Now, anything less than that 60, we're going to put them on a oxygen source. That's going to help increase the value, right? Now, same thing goes for the SAO2. What we want here is a value between 95 and 100, but we want to keep it above 90. So we do not want that SAO2 level dropping below 90, guys. If the SAO2 level drops below 90, we're going to apply an oxygen source. Now, to make note of, which is going to be discussed a little bit more later in a separate video, is that of COPD patients. Now, COPD patients, it's okay if their SAO2 level is between 88 and 92%. Now, why, you may ask? Well, for the COPD patients, their stimulus to breathe is the lack of oxygen, which is called the hypoxic drive. Their body senses low oxygen, and that's what triggers their inhalation. Now, for individuals without COPD, we breathe due to the body sensing an increase in CO2. Okay, so it's the reverse. Our body senses carbon dioxide, and the body's like, let's blow this off. Let's get it out. So due to the fact COPD patients breathe due to the lack of oxygen, if we give them too much oxygen, well, then they are not going to be triggered to breathe at all because the body's like, we breathe due to the lack of oxygen. Therefore, if we give them too much oxygen, or there's an oxygen source that is giving them too much oxygen. We got what we need. There's nothing we're missing. Therefore, we don't have to inhale or exhale. Therefore, they would go into an apneic episode for COPD patients. It would eliminate the hypoxic drive to breathe. So we're going to want to maintain low oxygen therapy for those COPD patients. Now, when discussing the next term here, which is V slash Q, it just refers to ventilation and perfusion. V equals ventilation, Q equals oxygenation or perfusion. They go hand in hand. So there's a whole bunch that goes into this topic, but for now, just know oxygenation should always be more than ventilation. Now, the main topic of this video, the oxygen hierarchy, okay? When giving O2 to patients, we're going to want to follow these steps. So we're going to start from the lowest to the highest in terms of oxygen therapy. It's kind of like analgesics. When a patient comes in, we don't just put them on morphine or dilaudid. There is stages. So we're going to start from Tylenol, oxycodone, and then morphine, for example. So here we are starting with low flow oxygen therapy and progressing. Now from low flow, there's high flow. Moving on to NPPV, which is non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, and then we're going to intubation, and lastly, mechanical ventilation, which is not going to be discussed that much in this video, morely in another video. Now, if a patient is unresponsive to any of these given oxygen therapies, meaning they are hypoxic as evidenced by a decrease in SAO2 or PaO2, that is when we are going to think about moving on to the next mode of oxygenation, which is going to serve or hopefully serve to provide a more concentrated set of oxygen for the patient, and that can maintain proper oxygen. So we're going to start with low flow devices, which consist of two things, nasal cannulas and face masks. Also to make note of is that there are three face masks, guys, and we're going to go over them individually. Now, Nasal cannulas. Here is a nasal cannula, 
and the stats behind it. So when using a nasal cannula, it's going to be important to remember that it ranges from one to six liters of oxygen and that it is placed in the external nares. Now it's also the most commonly used oxygen device due to things such as mobility and comfort for the patient. Another key fact is that the maximum amount of oxygen COPD patients can receive by means of nasal cannula is one to two liters, okay, for those COPD patients. Remember, they breathe due to the lack of oxygen, so we're going to provide little by little. We don't wanna give them too much. Now here are our face masks, and there are three to discuss. First is the simple face mask, then partial non-rebreather, and then a full non-rebreather face mask. So simple face masks, these are simple. They provide five to 10 liters of oxygen and are used for short-term oxygenation therapy. Also, they are very handy when transporting patients. So we're transferring a patient from the unit to maybe go to CAT scan or X-ray or to a different unit and we wanna maintain their oxygenation. We can slap on a simple face mask, transport them through the hallway, and that will benefit them very well. Moving on, we get to partial non-rebreather face masks, and they provide 8 to 10 liters of oxygen and are also used for short-term use. An important fact about these masks are that they have exhalation ports in them, which is going to allow the passing of exhaled gases out of the mask. You can see it right there, exhalation ports. That's going to allow for the passing of exhaled gases out of the mask, such as carbon dioxide. Now, for partial non-rebreather masks, there's also a reservoir bag that is attached to it, and oxygen is to be maintained to keep the reservoir bag half to one-third filled. Lastly, we get to our non-rebreather face mask. It's the last resort when it comes to the face masks. Now, there are one-way valves on this mask, which is going to prevent any exhaled air from entering the bag, which furthermore provides a constant oxygen supply to the patient. Also, a non-rebreather mask provides a minimum of 10 liters of oxygen, which is going to help maintain the inflation of the bag attached to the mask. Now, we get to our high flow devices. Here, we're going to discuss the Venturi mask, the aerosol mask, the face tent, and the high flow nasal cannula. So here is our first high flow device, a Venturi mask. Now a Venturi mask provides an accurate level of oxygenation as well as provides a range of oxygen from 24 to 60%. Now there are little adapters and each of them are color coded as shown in the image to the right and each color provides a specific level of oxygen. They're gonna indicate how much oxygen the patient is receiving, okay? so. The blue adapter, this is gonna provide 24% of oxygen, the white adapter, 28% of oxygen, the orange, 31, and so on. Next, we get to the aerosol mask. Now, this mask provides aerosol therapy, which consists of humidification and med administration. So this humidification that we just discussed also makes it easier to liquefy secretions for expectoration, and it also humidifies the respiratory tract. Now the aerosol mask also relieves bronchospasms and edema that may be causing any airway compromise. Next is the face tent, which is for patients who have suffered from face trauma, burns, or upper airway surgery. It also provides oxygen therapy without necessarily touching the face, as you can see in the image. The reason we want to add humidification or mist is to not cause any rhinitis or sinusitis to the patients. If we're just giving oxygen, it's pretty much gonna dry out the nasal cavity, gonna cause epistaxis, which is nosebleed. We don't want that. So we're gonna add humidification or mist. And here's our last high flow device, which is the high flow nasal cannula. Now this form of oxygen therapy humidifies and compresses air, as well as delivers oxygen up to 60 liters per minute. So it also is gonna reduce anatomical dead space in the lungs which is the spaces that don't get any oxygen or participate in any gas exchange, hence the name dead, dead space, they're just there. So the high flow nasal cannula is going to fill up those dead spaces, providing more oxygen to the patient that they can use at their disposal or the body can use at its disposal. Now, besides reducing anatomical dead space, it also helps with the PEEP, which is the positive end expiratory pressure that we naturally have. Usually a preset PEEP already exists in our lungs, and the PEEP serves to keep our lungs open, preventing it from collapsing during expiration. And the PEEP pretty much serves as a little pressure within the lungs. That way at the end of a full expiration, there's still a little pressure within that lung, keeping it open. 
Now, high flow nasal cannulas help even more by keeping our lungs open by adding extra PEEP. Now, we're going to move on to non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which consists of CPAPs and BiPAPs. So when discussing CPAP, it stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure, meaning it delivers positive pressure and only positive pressure continuously. And by delivering a continuous positive pressure, this is going to keep the airway open. So a CPAP is usually used for patients suffering from OSA, which is obstructive sleep apnea. Now, individuals that suffer from OSA, the airway is occluded because the throat muscles as well as the tongue relax and block the airway. That's when a CPAP is very beneficial because it's going to maintain the airway. It's going to continuously provide that positive airway pressure, which is going to keep the airway open by means of continuous positive pressure. Now we move to BiPAP. And BiPAP, this stands for bi-level positive airway pressure. And with BiPAP, instead of one continuous pressure, it delivers two continuous preset pressures, one for inspiration and one for expiration. So this mode is very helpful when removing carbon dioxide because remember, we can deliver an expiration goes both ways, hence the prefix by, meaning two. So if there's a patient on a vent and we see a blood gas where there's a high carbon dioxide, we can pretty much increase the respiratory rate, furthermore decreasing carbon dioxide. And the reverse holds true as well. If we see a low CO2 and we see a pH that is alkalotic and we want to bring it back a little down, we can slow the rate. And by slowing the rate, this is going to increase carbon dioxide because we're not releasing it, okay? Now, we're going to talk about intubation, which consists of an endotracheal tube and tracheostomy, okay? So we're going to see a bunch of stats on both the endotracheal tube and the tracheostomy. Now, we're going to start with the endotracheal tube and the bullets that come with it. Now, when it comes to ET tubes, they can be inserted orally or nasally. But orally is the preferred route, being that nasal intubation is considered a blind intubation because you're just pushing the tube up. You're really not sure which way it's going. That's what makes the oral route a little better because it provides a clearer visual when advancing the tube. Now the tube should be inserted just above the carina. The carina is the bottom portion of the trachea that separates the left and right bronchi. And we want it two to three centimeters above it. Now why two to three centimeters, you may ask? Well, this is due to the fact that the right bronchus is wider than the left one, and we don't want to accidentally intubate the right bronchi over the left. This is going to provide unequal oxygenation to the patient. You're going to see while delivering breath or oxygen to the patient, you're going to see the right lung expand and the left one partial expand or not expand at all. That's going to make us know or confirm that placement is morally in the right bronchi. So two to three centimeters is going to prevent that. Now the next important bullet is the balloon of the endotracheal tube, which is to be inflated 20 to 25 millimeters of mercury, which is going to prevent aspiration. If the balloon is not inflated enough to occlude the whole trachea, and there's a little space between the balloon, well, pretty much whatever they aspirated is going to go down past the balloon into the lungs. And that's called aspiration pneumonia, which can lead to various complications such as septic shock, which is why endotracheal tubes makes a patient at increased risk for pneumonia. Now, if intubation is taking too long, the nurse is to monitor the patient's saturation level and stop the respiratory therapist or the medical doctor and manually ventilate the patient, provide some form of oxygen due to the occlusion the intubation was causing. Now, when the ET tube is placed successfully, that we hope, we're going to verify the placement by means of an end tidal CO2, which is a device that measures carbon dioxide. Now, how does it measure the carbon dioxide exactly? Now, this device turns blue when CO2 touches it. And we're going to know that the tube is in the trachea and not the esophagus when this happens. We're going to put the device at the end of the tube. And if it turns blue, we know that we're getting CO2. Blue means CO2. Now, we're also going to want to verify placement by an x-ray. And checking for the rising and fall of the chest is important to make sure the patient is ventilating and not suffocating. So as for the nurse, you're going to document the placement of the tube in centimeters at the patient's lip, and it should be between 21 to 23 centimeters. Now, when intubating patients, it's going to be important to administer an analgesic 
for the pain, a sedative to relax them, and a paralytic that they don't feel anything prior to the intubation, okay? This is going to prevent any unplanned extubation. The patient can wake up and feel very uncomfortable. Prophylactically giving these things prior to the intubation is going to prevent any unplanned extubation. Next, we're going to discuss tracheostomies, which is the last slide of this presentation. This is required if mechanical ventilation is needed for greater than seven to 14 days, so one to two weeks. So by switching to a tracheostomy, this prevents laryngeal or upper airway damage that an endotracheal tube may have caused or may be causing. So to make note of, it is inserted within the second tracheal ring, which is in the image, and it is actually more comfortable than the endotracheal tube. Now, besides comfort, oral care is easier done and lip reading is easier to see when it comes to the tracheostomy over the endotracheal tube. Lastly, the complications that's associated with tracheostomies is that of tracheal stenosis, which is the stiffening of the trachea, and this is due to scar tissue from the tracheotomy cut. Also, another complication is that of a tracheoesophageal fistula, which is a passage that has formed connecting the trachea and the esophagus. It pretty much is a hole between the trachea and esophagus. And this can also happen with the endotracheal tube as well, because if we overinflate the cuff, which is over that 20 to 25, if we inflate it too much, it can pretty much expand and expand and expand till we get a fistula within the throat, okay? And it can also cause that same tracheoesophageal fistula. And that's a wrap. Thanks for tuning in. You can follow this video up with the oxygenation overview video that's provided below, or just jump into any respiratory disorder video. Thanks again, guys. Catch you next time.